Okay, so we're very fortunate to have um, Emmanuel here as our uh, Farm seminar speaker for today. Um, Emmanuel is scientist director at the Knox Institute for Quantum Optics and the professor at the LNU unit. Um, I think that probably many of you were in the colloquium yesterday where um, we heard about his distinguished career. He's won many prizes. Um, I won't list them all, but just to give a few, the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize of the German Science Foundation. Um, the Herbert European Science Prize, the Harvey Prize, um, so many uh, uh, distinguished awards. Um, we, I think many in this room know uh, Emmanuel is a pioneer of the field of uh, quantum simulation with all that, um, having really um, developed um, an amazing field of being able to study quantum many body physics with um, single particle uh, detection capability. And we'll see that. Beautiful experiments along those lines today. Um, just to sort of add maybe um, two, two things that weren't said in the introduction yesterday. Um, uh, so many of you might not know that Emmanuel actually um, did a spin at Stanford um, in the 1990s, I guess. Uh, working, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> working somewhere on Barry and Second and Four with Mark Kapovich. Uh, when was that? Yeah, probably, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he is a thesis and he is here. Um, and just on a personal note, I'll say um, I continue to be amazed. Um, Emmanuel leads this um, large research group spread between Max Planck Institute and the university with, um, uh, with 20 PhD students, and somehow everybody gets individual attention that is a mentorship. And as having been a postdoc in the group myself, um, I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful for that. So with that, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, Monica. Um, yeah, as I said yesterday, I was really grateful to be able to be present again. Learning what's going on here. Uh, we're doing. So today, I, I think this topic is uh, quite complementary to what we talked about yesterday in the colloquium. Uh, one is about how the delivery dynamics. So it's a mic. Oh, there's no mic. Can I use the uh, microphone? Is this on? on? Or is it just yeah, for the Zoom people? Is it for us also? Do you, I don't think it's. Do you hear me better with this? Yeah. Really? Okay. Okay. All right. Then I'll use it. Um, oh, it's translating. It's transcribing me automatically. <laughs> <laughs> I better watch out. Okay. So. Um, Yes, I, I picked two topics today, quite complementary to what we uh, heard yesterday in the talk. So on the one hand, I want to talk about the interesting kind of transport phenomena. We, we ran into that actually, you know, is, is found or discovered just a few years ago, actually, in, in Heisenberg quantum magnets. Now, you might imagine what can we learn about the Heisenberg model that we don't know yet from this really you know, decades old model. But it turns out, actually, there, there's a very interesting new transport phenomena, and I'll show you a little bit the evidence we have there, what we know and what we don't know also, there are also many open questions. And the second part of the talk will actually be quite a quantum optics type talk. So something for a different crowd of people, maybe that will hopefully connect to uh, both crowds here in the, in, the, in, in the room. So I'll talk a little bit about these uh, sub-wavelength atomic arrays as novel light matter interfaces. This is also a topic that only came up recently, I think in the last few years, where people noticed actually that you know, by structuring spatial emitters, quantum emitters for light and patterning them in arrays, uh, we can have actually really uh, quite remarkable new interfaces. And I'll tell you a little bit why that is, why that happens and what people might have overlooked in the past. And uh, I'll also tell you one of the most recent stuff we've been doing is controlling and using a very high nonlinearity in the system by being able to use a single atom to switch the entire mirror, for example, that you can form in these systems. So that, that's the two things I'd like to do. So let's start with um, uh, Kata Parisi Zhang, Superdiffusion. This is actually a work together with Norm Yaosu and Saran Krishna. I really learned a lot from both of them on the topic. And uh, so let me, let me tell you what it's about. And actually, we have to start with totally classical physics, uh, but it's actually beautiful classical physics. It's really uh, been very influential on one hand on the physics side. This topic was introduced by Manan Kata. Uh, George Parisi and Ching Chan. And then on the other side, also in mathematics, this has become actually a really important field where you know, the, the field medal was awarded to Martin Heirer, who, who 
learn how to solve this, this differential equation. So what is this differential equation? It's a stochastic partial differential equation. It's typically used in statistical physics to describe the growth of a high field. So if you want to grow a surface, for example, and you drop the recovered particles from above, and you want to know how this high field grows, so you have uh, something here, a variable h, this stochastic variable, uh, which is describes the height of the field as a position on the surface, x, for example, uh, and some time. Okay, and this describes the growth rate of this height field. And this is a stochastic variable, so it means it includes like fluctuations. So it's a fluctuating one. So it can have some average growth rate, but it will have fluctuations also included. And then the high field grows the following way. There's kind of a smoothing term, this last action here, where it basically describes when you drop a particle from above, it typically will spread out on the surface. So they will spread out. And there's the stochastic fluctuations, which is this kind of stochastic processes, how these particles are caught and interact with each other. And then there's this kind of this term, which is a typical term, which makes this a nonlinear. Uh, partial uh, stochastic partial differential equation, which depends on the gradient of the high field square. So this is where all the complications come from. So um, yeah, so when we when we find this, actually we find almost everywhere in, in, in around us. It's very very common. It's uh, very common in the you know, bacterial tumor growth, for example. If you look at the properties of the surface of the bacteria or the tumor, they are described by such equations. And if you find the particular crystal. You find in traffic flow, you find it in plug fire. I, I never, I didn't know what a plug fire was before. You know what a plug fire is? That's pretty amazing. Okay, so go to YouTube and go uh, find the best, look at some videos of a plug fire. So this burn, this stuff burns remarkably well, actually. And as so you have this plug here, and then you set burning, you get this fire front here. Also, to raise that equation. Even if you put your coffee down on the table and you get the coffee stain, you'll find actually also the trade. Like that, they're kind of only design equation or snow surface. So it's really statistical physics and growth of surfaces, it's, it's really abundant and well known. Um, actually, it's actually, kids like to do this. If you go and do it on YouTube, this is really very clear. Kids love the plot wire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's now a notion of that I want to introduce. Of universality in, in this uh, system, so I'd like to explain a little bit better. So, on the one hand, we have a KD equation which describes the growth of the field, but the features that come out of this uh, KPD equation of the high field they have special properties. And in order to understand what the special properties are, let's again look a little bit how this growth process is different from just a random dropping of um, particles from the top. And for that, I Say just let's let's play kind of a Tetris game where we drop particles, we drop from the top, and in the one hand we don't have this gradient h square term, and that means you basically just drop particles from the top and just fall down their column, and they uh, don't stick to each other. And, and mostly, so then after some dropping of the particles, you would get maybe some high field that looks like this, right? So you have some average growth of the high field and fluctuation, so like the square root of n. On the other hand, if you have a process which I call now sticky papers, this is a variation of the game where you drop the block now, but once it reaches an adjacent block, it sticks to that block. Okay, so it doesn't fall all the way down the column, but if there's an adjacent block, it will stick to that block. And that generates a very different kind of high field. This is how this looks like. You grow like that. And you immediately, I can see already visually by eye that the high field generates like that. It's a completely different than you want when you have independent columns. So it's very, very different process. Now, the way how our people characterize this, that we look at the fluctuations and correlations of this type of okay. And this is what we find when this so called universality class, this KPC universality class. So we, we have the height field here, which again describes how high is the field here at position x and times t. There will be some average growth rate, average linear growth rate. And then there will be fluctuations, for example, in, in, in each column here, which for this KPZ universality class scale like t to the one third. So that's different from t to the one fourth that you would expect to report uh, on a non interaction model that we have before, the Edward Thomas model and the uh, Edward Wilkinson colleague model. And here actually we get this t to the one third behavior. So fluctuations go like t to the one third. And the stochastic variable. So this is a, just some distribution function from which you draw every time, each time step you draw uh, a, a value. And this uh, 
this distribution function here is actually very special. This distribution function is so called the crazy Wigan distribution function for the Gaussian. It's called the crazy Wigan distribution function has kind of a shape, shape like this. What generates this fluctuating ground. All right. And there are also <laughs> lateral uh, correlations, which actually I'll come back to in the end of this talk. So if you, if you look at this, what you find then is that the fluctuations of this height scale in each column should stay like uh, to the theta, where theta is one third in the case of the universality, and transverse correlations or space and time should be linked by the dynamical scope in Z, and Z in the case of the universality is the uh, three halves. So that's what we call super diffusion. By super diffusion, remember if you have diffusion, then space and time would be linked by uh, one half. And if you would have ballistic expansion, then Z would be one. And somehow here we have something in between. As we call this uh, super diffusion. It's faster than diffusion, but not as fast as ballistic. So that's how we get out of this. Everything I told you so far was just pretty classical physics, but we're in a quantum <laughs> seminar, so you know, better get to the quantum part also now. Uh, and that was the surprise actually that in 2017, 2019, the group of uh, Thomas Bosch in Slovenia found that actually there is actually also transport phenomena with this kind of universality class scaling also in a physical transport. And it's not standard transport at low temperatures. It's actually transport phenomena that occurs at infinite temperatures in the Heisenberg model. So it's not something that we uh, would have maybe expected, where we basically know everything, for example, from the low energy description of the model from, from other uh, liquid theory, for example, in one dimension. It's really something that occurs at infinite temperatures. What I mean by that, I'm going to come here in a second. And there's actually a nice paper from Joel Moore uh, here at Berkeley who actually looked at this crossover with right, from low temperatures to high temperatures, how you go from this behavior to this uh, basically. So, what do I mean by, uh, by uh, infinite temperature transport? So, imagine now we have a 1D spin chain, Heisenberg chain. So, you have this uh, Heisenberg couplings in there, and there's an infinite temperature, which basically means you have a random orientation of the spin in the chain. Let's say, well, we fix the central spin to be spin up. That's where everything's random, but the central spin is, is up. And now we're asking how will this central spin now, which is up, spread in this infinite temperature environment of function of time? That's what we're asking. Okay. And I guess maybe if you would have known nothing about the problem, uh, you would have maybe thought, well, it would be like diffusion or kind of spread the system. And the way how we can quantify this is looking at this uh, spin spin correlation function, where we basically say, okay, we know the position of the spin at position zero here, at time zero, this is the spin up. And we want to know how does the spin spread to a position x at time t at a certain distance. So we're looking at this dynamical spin spin correlation function, which can tell us something about the spreading of the spin in the infinite temperature environment. So this would be the first guess, the integrated guess. If you do, and you find actually that's wrong. But that's not the case. Uh, and uh, what was actually found in deep by Thomas Rosen group from the numerics is that this dynamical spin spin correlation function scales like a very special function uh, connected to this KPD physics, the KPD scaling function, with a dynamical exponent which takes space and time uh, like three halves. Uh, this comes from numerics from DMRT simulations or not state simulations. Also, they did uh, different uh, variations of this for the longer times uh, in, in the screen type models. And if you look at now the spreading of that spin in the infinite temperature environment, you see it actually follows very, very nicely the blue curve with ABD scaling function in the model Gauss. So that's that's where the ABD people for the first time thought, well, enough. maybe there's a connection there. Uh, actually, a different way how to measure this uh, kind of spreading of a single impurity is rather to do some a different experiment. What we're going to do is look at how a domain wall melts. And in the limit of a very, very small contrast of this domain wall, then basically uh, the dynamical spin correlation function would be linked to the derivative of the domain wall profile that we have. So you can show that's an exact equation basically for the infinitely small domain wall. And that's actually really how we're going to measure this. So now people made a conjecture. This is a conjecture I say we got no, there's no proof for this. Just just based conjecture from coming from the narrative. But this conjecture, as you will see, 
has gives us predictions for the experiment, what we can test. So it's, it's, a, it's a, it gives us strong predictions actually that's true. So you know, I told you that from quantum numerics, people found this is true that the dynamical spin correlation function, which describes the spreading of the individual spin, and this is in both like the KPT scaling function. We also know from KPT physics from the KPT uh, kind of equation that actually, if you look at the growth of the height field, then the derivative of the height field at xp and the derivative of the height field at zero zero also gives you the KPT scaling function. That we also know. Yes. Uh, uh, just a very quick question to make sure I understand what that two time correlator means. Yes. Which one? Yeah. The one at the top? The one at the top. <clears throat> so, should I think of this as saying I initialize my system in a product state of up and down spins on each site where I know what the spin state is at zero and then I evolve? For example, yes. So, so no entanglement between sites at equal zero. Well, there could be. You could start. You wouldn't have to be a product state. You could start with any state you want. Basically, it's just that you want to fix the central spin to be defined. Okay, uh, that's what we mean by that. But it wouldn't have to be a product state. It could be also any, any you know, highly entangled thermal state, infinite right. temperature state. Right, so, you, so basically it tells you here, you measure in the spin, you know the spin at uh, position zero times zero, and you're asking how is that correlated with the spin later of finding that spin at position x times t. But this is by the spreading of the spin. Okay. okay, this we know, this we also know, and now people conjecture, well, if this is equal to the KPD scaling function, this is equal to the KPD scaling function, well, then maybe these two quantities are the same. Okay. Maybe then the quantum variable of the spin, the quantum operator of the spin, basically corresponds to the derivative of the stochastic variable, the derivative of the height field. Okay, so this is what people conjecture then. <coughs> and this would mean like the fluctuations that you have, for example, in this quantum variable are given by the fluctuations in this um, high field variable coming out of this uh, equation. So it would allow us basically then to use it. This is true to use and to describe the quantum transport of the spin of the magnetization in the system by the simple KPD equation. Yeah. All right. But this, okay, this is a conjecture now that people make. And if you now integrate over entire space, then you see actually that means if you integrate on the left side and the right side over the entire space, it means, for example, you're measuring the polarization transfer. So if you integrate over the local magnetization, over entire space, you're looking at the polarization transfer, and that uh, on the right hand side should be connected then to the height field at position zero at time. All right, so that's that's the conjecture. But from this conjecture, actually, uh, things follow that we can test in, in our experiment. So, for example, if that is true, then the polarization transfer should stay like uh, t to the one over z, where z is the dynamical exponent, and it should then stay like t to the two thirds, so z being the half. And the fluctuations of this variable here, remember, this fluctuations would be the fluctuations of the height field. This fluctuations of the polarization transfer should correspond to the fluctuations of the height field. And remember, in KPC physics, in KPC universality class, the fluctuations of the height field stay like t to the one third and this crazy widow distribution. Okay, so that's a strong prediction. Right? Uh, so that's something we can, we can now test. Actually, the first experiments were not done in the important atom system, so I should give credit to a really very nice work on atom tendency <coughs> on neutron scattering. We found first evidence for this quantum transport um, <coughs> see, dynamical exponent being three halves in neutron scattering experiments, and it found to be like 1.25, not exactly 1.5, but at least you know some first evidence that this is very different from ballistic or, or diffusive. So, okay, so here's now what we're going to do. We're going to look at the, the Heisenberg model. Uh, we're going to be at the isotropic point where delta is one, and we're going to check those predictions. And we're also going to check if we break uh, some assumptions that underlie this system, for example, go from 1D to 2D, where we break integrability, or if we magnetize the system and break, uh, for example, its two symmetry, if the transport is still uh, super diffusive and all the KPD or the CPA. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about the system. I told you already yesterday more about it. So we have uh, one chains uh, where we can produce now uh, 50 spins in a homogeneous potential. 
and we have typically 20 of those chains. Okay, they can be independent chains, but you can also couple them together to form a 2D system. So we can go from 1D to 2D. So this is what the system actually looks like uh, that we're going to study. And we have kind of local control where we can initialize the system to be, for example, this domain wall state. So this is a picture where you can see that. So these are the many 1D systems. And we're doing this spin dependent image where I you know, spin up atoms show up here, the spin down atoms show up here, and we can create an initial state which is this perfect domain wall. So all the spin ups are to the left, and all the spin downs are to the right. Okay. And then we can let time evolve, and you can see how these spin downs penetrate into the region of the spin ups, and the spin ups penetrate into the region of the spin downs. And you can see a single image of that, so we can measure, you know, how many of those spins propagate in the other region. These are the snapshots I talked about yesterday. And for many of those snapshots, I can not only measure what's the average number of spins that have been transformed, but I can measure the full distribution function of spins that have been transformed, right? So I can measure all the fluctuations of that variable with polarization. So um, now it's also important to do this experiment at higher temperatures or higher energy densities. This is uh, very close to a, a pure state. It's not a linear response where the KPZ prediction is believed to strictly hold, but we can still test it here. So we do another type of experiment where we just reduce the contrast of this domain wall by defacing the spins and basically doing an experiment like this. Where you see now the contrast of this domain wall is much taller, but it's still very sharply defined, and we can still measure all the quantities that I that I've shown. All right, so we can do the first experiment and measure polarization transfer. How many spins are transferred on average as a function of time? And this is our data here, and you can see the magnetization profiles here at different points in time, and uh, we can uh, fit a curve to that, uh, and we find. Uh, Curve here where t to the one over z to this uh, data, we find 1.54 with an error set. So very, very good agreement already with the with the super behavior to expect. If you scale then by a super this space and time by this three half exponent, you can actually see you get also a nice collapse of all the spin profiles that you have in the system. And you also see it's really very different, it's very clearly different from ballistic transport, which is what this black curve would give us. Or a diffusive transport, which would be the red curve. So, in a long long plot, it's very, very clear that we see this three halves exponent. All right, so now let's again, as I say, check some assumptions of the system. Let's turn on interchain coupling and go from 1D to 2D. And what you see actually when you do that experiment is that you see a breakdown, that you see that the transport exponent actually evolves into the diffusive regime and for the full. Full system, full CD system, you would expect standard diffusive transport. Actually, you expect the transport also will be diffusive. It's just that the system has not evolved long enough to see that it's in, in the diffusive regime. That's why we're seeing something between 1.5 and 2 in the system. We can also magnetize the system. So we put a little bit more spin up into the system than spin down. So that's what we mean by breaking the SU2 symmetry of the underlying model. Uh, and if we do that, actually, we find more ballistic transport than uh, uh, super diffusion. So we can do the same experiment and then we find um, basically ballistic transport. So I just summarized this for you on this, this graph. So this is the dimension of the problem that we're studying 1D, uh, SU2 symmetric point with no magnetization, <coughs> we see a dynamical exponent of 3R. 1D magnetized, uh, we see ballistic transport, Z equal 1. And 2D, uh, non magnetized, we see a dynamic exponent of two, so the fusion is So now that's good, but we can do a much more stringent test. This is even more exciting and really exploits the power, I think, of the artificial quantum system that we have at hand. Because remember, I told you the fluctuations are important here for this universality class. It's not only the average quantity, it's really about the fluctuations, the correlations. <coughs> So we can look at the, remember the fluctuations of the height field in KPC universality class scale like two to the one third and should correspond to a Tracy Witten distribution function. Okay, so the distribution of the height field should go in amplitude on average like two to the one third and the distribution function should be this Tracy Witten distribution function. And we can check that also. So I can see here the mean polarization transfer. Red is the, green is the, um, Green is the one, sorry, green is the 1D system, red is the 2D system. 
and you see green, you find this average uh, transfer with a dynamical exponent of three half. And actually, if we look at the fluctuations of the polarization transfer, we find one third. Okay, point three one. So in, 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 in agreement with what we expect from A to Z in the Westerling. And then there's another function, one thing that's peculiar about these uh, Tracy Williams distribution functions, they have a skewness. For even long times, they are not symmetric. <coughs> skewed. And we can measure this, of course, also we can measure the skewness of our polarization transfer distribution function. And we see one D and D is a finite skewness. And in our case, we're pretty much agrees with this GOE kind of Tracy Widom distribution function that one has. Whereas if we go to 2D, you see that becomes more and more symmetric uh, uh, over time. And actually, for the experts, uh, I should say something new that we analyzed recently. We also looked at the transverse correlation. So remember, these were correlations of the height field at one point, uh, basically in space. Uh, and, but we can also look at correlations of the height field at different points in space. This corresponds to basically polarization transfer correlations in space in our case. And we indeed also see there, if we rescale it to the super diffusive behavior, we see also a perfect agreement with the, well, perfect, but some agreement with the um, uh, processes that one expects from the KPD universality class with these different uh, correlations that we expect in the transverse region, so called every one or every two process, depending on the initial conditions. And we indeed find a rather good agreement. With this um, every two uh, process in this every sorry every one process in this and so also transverse correlations uh, we can check in the system and they seem to agree with this. All right, so it seems like the story is solved. The KPZ universality class looks fine. Uh, we found this new transfer phenomena, transport phenomena, but it actually turns out it, the story is not not simple, and uh, we don't really, for example, we do not know. What is actually the KPZ equation that underlies the transport of the spin? So I can tell you it's in that universality class, but I can't tell you what the actual differential equations are, which I would like to know if I would like to calculate that something then. We also really don't know how these initial conditions of the spin profiles map to initial conditions of the height profiles that we would put into that equation and evolve it to predict what we have. So we can somehow say it's in that universality class, but we still don't know what the underlying equation is. So that's a problem, right? So that would be something to find out. We also don't really, I think, understand exactly very well why this KTZ physics appears here, also not precisely well understood. And maybe also whether there are dynamical time scales involved that one uh, become important, whether there's a crossover time scale that we have changed the behavior of the system for longer times. Right now in the experiment, I think we are we are already doing something which goes beyond what we can do in Merits, but I'm eager to hear the new methods, you know, the data I try with Google and with Google to push that because they're really, I think, important questions to ask. All right, that's all I wanted to say about the um, um, KPD. Just to remind you again, we've seen super diffusive transport, we've seen the polarization fluctuations, they scale like uh, one third. We've seen the finite skewness of the polarization transfer, which is characteristic for this crazy Widom distribution. And we see that if we break either x to symmetry or we break integrability of the model by going from 1 to 2D, we destroy KPD behavior. Okay, so that's what we could just say from the mental point of view. And um, I think Agile will come out soon in a week or so. So if you're interested in that, you can read more about it. All right. Yeah, so any, any questions on that? Otherwise, I would. Which is something completely different. Yes. To what extent do you think that your um, model of the quantum system, like matching up with KPZ fiction, do you think you could go backwards at all, like things you learned on your quantum system that would apply back to the classical system, but also apply to KPZ? Sorry, I didn't agree. Do you, do you think that anything you learn on the quantum system yes. um, could be um, taken and, and used to understand the classical systems that also are applied by KPZ or other systems that are applied by where KPZ applies? Yeah, I would say that for me, at least, seems to for me, the KPZ physics in the classical case is quite well understood. Not everything, there's still people that are working on this. This is really a difficult, also mathematical problem. Um, like Abash Born, for example, and other mathematical physics have worked a lot on this. I think Abash Born is one of the variants. And, uh, it's really nice. What you typically have is some asymmetric walker process, and yes, basic models they make in one need uh, to look at these processes. I'm not so sure we can learn more about the classical case, but I think what is very peculiar here is why does it appear? 
because we don't have any asymmetry also in the problem. What is the underlying equation actually? Why can't we? Why doesn't the standard equation work? So there must be something more here. Uh, is there a crossover time scales involved also in this problem? I would like to explore. Yeah. So these are there are quite a few open questions that I think for the quantum case are totally open because we cannot go to very long times both in the experiment and the merits. So all our knowledge is limited and we can't do very much analytically there. Yeah. Um, is there anything spe like special about treehouse? I I couldn't appreciate the so it, that was this earlier experiment yes. which is one point three four or whatever, and how you measure a point point that treehouse exactly yeah. is. And is that space between one and two like does treehouse have a special meaning in that space or is it just um, it can take on any value? Well, it's well so, uh, super diffusion would be anything between one and two basically, but in KPZ it has to be one point five. Ah, okay. So in KPC universality, it has to be one point five. And so the earlier experiment, maybe the underlying thing just was in KPC. Or... Yeah, look, it was a solid state experiment. So. <laughs> Can I say it's, it's a real material that has its problems. So it, 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 it's not a screen. I think they did a great job. You know, it really you have to say it's a, it was a great experiment that they could make this out of the neutron scattering data. But uh, then there's always couplings. It's not perfect. One D, you always have finite couplings to other chains in the system. Also, not so clear how temperature are they within the infinite temperature limit. So, I we would have to ask Alan to, to learn more about some more presentations. But I think, yeah, I think it shows the power of this system where things are much cleaner. Yeah. So, on this topic of universality, yes. are there uh, specific parameters you can tune so that the early time behavior changes? Yeah. Quite a lot, but you see the same late time asymptotics. Very good question. So we believe that that is actually what is kind of, uh, I didn't talk now too much about it in detail, but since you're asking what was surprising to us that, you know, we find KPC is strictly only supposed to hold in the linear response regime so for this kind of single purity case. But we even see KPC at least, you know, super diffusion for this domain wall, which is completely non equilibrium transport. And the question is now why? And I think Sarang believes, for example, what happens is that there's a crossover time scale, which somehow scales chromatically with like one over either cube, but either would be the visibility of this domain wall. Mm -hmm. So when the system crosses over to the of behavior, that's that means that actually the true nature of transport for this system would be diffusive, and only in the linear response regime KPZ strictly holds. Mm -hmm. Now, why you see KPZ, everything looks like KPZ up to the time scales we can look and, and the numerics DMRG can look. That's not understood. And to find out more, we would have to go to longer times. That's why I'm interested. If, if numerics could go to longer times, then we would see the crossover to diffusive behavior. And then we could also check if we change the visibility of the domain wall, you know, can we check the scaling of how that crossover time scale might, might change? Uh -huh. So that's the big open question. And that's what, for example, people like Thomas Porsche believe. But there's no, there's absolutely no, we don't have any any evidence for that. It's just a conjecture. But they, have, but they have conjectures coming from classical models which they've studied where they see that behavior and they think the quantum model is the same. But mm -hmm. I think, okay, I, we have to check that. Have to check that. Maybe the quantum model is different. That would be even more exciting. All right. Okay, very good. So, yeah, so that was the non equilibrium. Part of the physics, so let me go switch completely gears now and uh, talk about uh, quantum optics or sub wavelength arrays. If you allow me, I will just use uh, five minutes to wipe off here, that's okay, and explain to you uh, in a simple way why, why this is actually really a really different topic and why uh, people I think have overlooked this a little bit and now become so fashionable again. And then I'll talk about our experiments. But you know, in quantum optics, of course, the ultimate thing that we want to do is we want to couple our two level system. Level atom or a couple light to matter, right? That's everything we do is, is coupling light to matter, taking it with light matter in some cases. But of course, this process in general is quite inefficient if you just focus down your laser beam to some area A and you have um, a wavelength lambda of this resonant condition, then we know that this interaction square is will scale like something like lambda squared, which is just a cross section of absorption of a single level emitter by the area in the system. Okay, so 
that's not so good. Actually, there's Christian Kutzifa in Singapore holds the record of, of really matching the emission pattern uh, of a single dipole emitter of the two-level atom to the incoming radiation field. And by doing that very well, you can get maybe 20% yeah, in the free space. No cavity, nothing wrong. Single emitters. Okay, that's the best today. Still, I think the record by Christian in Singapore. Now, of course, if you're here at Stanford, you you know, you love your cavities, so you, you put a cavity around it. Why, why does that help? Well, it's just you make this graph, and the probability here is now just the number of bounces of light times lambda squared over A. You just enhance how often the light passes. Uh, and that's basically you then something like a probability that you just bring over kappa gamma factor that everybody can imagine. Now, then there's also another way to do that. That's the where people from atomic ensembles come in. They tell you, well, don't use a single atom, just use n atoms, right? So now you just have n atoms times lambda squared over A, and you can uh, store in the whole ensemble, and, uh, you can also enhance the interaction. And this would be something then that uh, would stay like then with the, with the optical density that we have. So if you're working with ensembles, you want to have as dense as possible. Um, Ensembles to have this really strong company. Now, there's another way you can do that, and that was realized, I think, recently that if you use structured arrays of atoms, of emitters, it's not really atoms, it's also any emitter, then you can actually also have an extremely strong and selective uh, light atom company. And uh, let me explain that to you. There's a very interesting results in that. So let's just go for the paper. Let's imagine we have an array of atoms here, and let's just look at a one dimensional situation. Okay. Direction and uh, the spacing of these atoms is has some spacing D here. And uh, now we want to look that there's some coupling of the atoms. These atoms are emitters, so atom can emit a photon, the photon can be absorbed by this atom, can be emitted or absorbed. The way how we basically describe this just as a spin model would be just to say, well, the interaction between the photons that's just Jij, you know, basically, I don't know, we destroy an excitation on the i atom and Late excitation of the J atom. Okay, so it's something a spin model like that, a long range interaction spin model that describes the hopping of the photon here. And this coupling strength, we will talk about we calculate that from, from the optical properties of the system. Okay, so what will be the eigenstates of the system if you just have a single excitation in the system? Well, this will be just drop waves. So we can immediately write down the eigenstate of the system, which will be just the superposition of the IK. Um, this i is the normal i is j, where we basically have let's say the j atom excited, all the other atoms in the ground state. Okay, so we sum over basically all the atoms in the system. So this would be the eigenstates, and now we can calculate with this coupling from that Hamiltonian, we can calculate that the basically eigen energies of that mode k, and that will in general be a complex quantity, will have a real part of the value which is right there. Energy and we have a complex part which describes the decay rate of that state. Okay. So, this would be a complex one. So, let's look at the dispersion relation of a single excitation. So, let's make the plot where we've got real part of omega k of the mode versus k. Okay, let's start with a single emitter. If there would be just a single emitter, well, there would be the resonance frequency of the single emitter would be somewhere here, omega dg. Okay. Emitter, but now we have many emitters. We know there's going to be a band forming, an energy band forming, and this might, might look probably, maybe look something like this. So, and then this is defined then up to the Brown zone in the system. So, this would be pi over E minus pi over E. Okay, so that would be the dispersion relation now of this excitation trapped in that array. Now, let's draw a standard. Free space light cone. So this 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 k vector here is the k vector of excitation along this array. So let's let's draw the normal light cone line. This um, you just uh, omega equals ck, right? Free space light cone. And uh, that means something interesting is happening, especially for those states here. You have states where basically now for the energy that you have, you have a k vector that is larger than the maximum possible k vector of light in free space. 
if you could uh, maximum possible k vector would be just omega plus c, but this omega, the maximum possible k vector is this one here. But if you are here, you've created something which has an even larger k vector than the maximum possible k vector could be. What does that mean? Well, that means that excitation cannot decay in these space. So we cannot radiate. There's no mode that uh, it can go into. Which means we're actually dealing with a state with class of states in here, which can radiate. Their radiative properties will be modified. There will be energy shifts and also decay rate shifts. We'll talk about that. Actually, we're mostly looking at the K for zero mode. But actually, there's this really nice class of states here, which are completely uh, basically non radiative, where you have no decay, where they're completely trapped. Okay. So the, you just put an excitation an atom in this superposition state, and I'm telling you it will never, it will never decay for an infinity size system. For a finite size system, of course, what will happen, you know, for a finite size system, there will be edge effects, and edge effects mean division will happen here at the end. It's like a fiber, optical fiber, formed by this array of one-dimensional systems, and there will be division coming out at the end, and that will determine the decay rate of that state. How does that, well, how does that determine the lifetime? Imagine we have a length of this array of n. It turns out people like Barry Chang and people who work this out, actually turns out the lifetime is very large. It can go like and gamma zero, the normal two uh, atom lifetimes divided by NQ. So even if you have just uh, 10 atoms, this could be a thousand times longer lived than a single free space atom. Is it the same scaling for a ring? Yeah, I'll go to the 2D situation in a second. Yeah. So uh, everything I told you in, in, in one d 2D, the same thing happens. If you draw the same picture, if you have a two dimensional array, so now we just extend the whole picture to 2D. So we have kx, ky, and we have here um, pi over d, right? pi over d, and now I draw the light cone, which let's say we are now again in the situation. Ah, I should say, when, when can this happen? When can you have this state? This, this it means that you are in a condition that d has to be smaller than lambda over 2. So the uh, distance between the mirrors has to be smaller than half the wavelength of your two-level system. That's just the condition we just talked about. Now, to me, the same thing happens. We now have a two dimensional ground zone. We can also draw the light cone. This would be omega equals ck at the maximum point. And then we have these are the radiative states with modified radiative properties because they are now these properties in the collective state. And then we have here this class of states which are completely non radiative, which will never be. I think the most exciting experiment, which we'll also do sometime, is to prepare an excitation here and really see that just having this array, nothing else, the excitation is not the same. As let's say a million times, again, there will be edge effects. This is if you have a finite two dimensional system, it will radiate out of the edges of the system. Actually, in this case, the lifetime could go like depending on the state n minus n minus six. So, even again, the very small, we're talking about the 10 by 10 array. Means I can get a suppression by a million in the, in the decay rate of that body. So a 10 by 10 array, really small. Yeah. All right, that's everything I've okay, so now you know why this is interesting. <laughs> Hopefully. So let's let's do some experiments and show you that this actually actually also works. And unfortunately, we're not in this regime of this non-radiative state, but you're actually going to see that also for the radiative states, we, we can actually see very interesting properties. So um, yeah, sorry, I'm uh, Okay, so I remind you again what well, everything I told you is the following. Imagine you have a two level uh, system, you couple it to the electromagnetic vacuum, and what you get for that two level atom is a decay rate of the atom in the excited state to the ground state, and a land shift, also an energy shift of the involved states. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe you did that calculation. Now, now I want to case what I'm telling you okay, take an array of atoms, couple them to the electromagnetic vacuum. They will also decay, but they will have collective decay rates depending on the eigenstates of this array and collective lamp shifts, lamp shifts, which will now also depend on the you know, mode vector of, of, of your excitation in that array. This is the block wave I just described. Okay. All right, how does this connect to very simple physics that we know from two level, uh, two atoms, uh, or, or uh, thicker super radiance that people in? One of these know that very well. Also, a very well known cooperative phenomena is if you bring many emitters uh, very close, much closer than lambda to each other, you see an enhanced 
decay rate of those atoms. You see a modified decay rate in this regime where basically they become point particles uh, concentrated here. This is what we call the super radiance in the system, uh, 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 or, or, or sorry, sub radiance, where basically that decay rate. Uh, as super radiance and sub radiance so that can go to the decay rates of H2 zero to zero. So now what about these extended arrays? So how do we can we calculate that? Well remember each each of our atoms, each of our dipoles emits an electric field. Uh, and this electric field is just described by the uh, propagator uh, for dipole radiation. So this would be the field that we create from this dipole radiating dipole at position R. So this is the field emitted by I pole I. Uh, detected at position R. And then from the outside, we're going to drive those dipoles with an incoming laser crew. Okay, so we drive those. Okay, we do that for uh, two atoms and now change the spacing between the atoms. Uh, so we change the ratio, the distance between the atoms over lambda. We see actually that this uh, the radiated properties of the system actually change. So we can have here's the decay rate. Um, versus so gamma over gamma zero minus one. So below negative values, which uh, correspond to subradiant states uh, with a slower decay rate, and um, states up here, which would correspond to superradiant states with a faster decay rate. And you see how, the, how this oscillates. And the delta is how the corresponding lamp shift, the cooperative lamp shift, would oscillate in the system. All right, so now to do that for many emitters, you just do the same equation. You have basically now you have an external drive. But you have the emission field from the J dipole driving basically my I dipole. So this is the receiver dipole. We uh, emit light from the J dipole. We propagate it as some polarizability of our I atom, and this induces some dipole here. And then you get a couple set of equations that console self consistently, and you basically get these collective radiative modes that are described in the system. Right, and everything like for now the condensed matter physicists, if you don't like this one of this language, everything can be cast into this basically long range attractive spin model that I told you about, <laughs> where you can just based on your propagators, your propagators on electromagnetism for your dipole radiation, you can calculate those JIJs, so the coherent coupling strengths, but also the decay rate of those modes. Okay. Right, here's what I showed you before. Here's the numerics actually from direct transfer for a 2D system. So for in-plane uh, polarization of the emitters, you see the radiating states are here. This is again, the circle is precisely the light cone, and then you have all these non-radiated states, which are outside here, which would not radiate. All right. So now, uh, it turns out if you do now this for an array of emitters, uh, this array of emitters, uh, if, even if you look at the radiated modes, for example, the Q equals zero mode, then they have a very strong interaction with the light field that you have incident on them, and they can, in principle, form perfect mirrors. So the single monolayer of, an, of this atomic array, of this spatially ordered array, can act like a spatial, uh, like a perfect spatial mirror. And that's what I want to show you. So this is one of the first experiments we did on that. We, we basically now come all our insulators into play that you learned about, all right? They are this uh, one atom per lattice side, and we are indeed in a regime where the uh, wavelength of light um, is, is the data spacing is smaller than the wavelength of light. So we're in this regime where we expect this cooperative behavior and to calculate, for example, how the, as we change the spacing in the system, how we change the radiative properties and the lamp shift and you can see what goes from super radiance to sub radiance to super radiance for this Q equals zero mode. So if we're talking about this one mode here, this one, well, we have exciting uh, wave with positive momentum zero because we're going to impinge vertically on the array, and there's no transverse momentum coming from the light field. If you send a plane wave onto the array, it has zero transverse momentum. So this is the mode we're talking about, and we'll have modified properties. Okay, and these are the properties you can calculate. Uh, it has this property lamp shift and the, the decay rate. Okay, so just a reference for you. We're using rubidium atoms, their free space decay rate is 6.1 megahertz, and these are the numbers for the wavelength and the uh, matter spacing in our system. Okay. All right, so here's uh, the first uh, experiment where we did the experiment. We took this ordered array and we measured the transmittance of a signal that we sent onto the array or the reflected signal. We send the light from below and look at how much light is actually reflected. And then we can do that spectrally resolved. 
So I can uh, measure that as a function of frequency. Sorry, this is cut off here. Um, so we can be megahertz. So we can measure the line width of this transition. And you actually already see the dashed line I show here. This is the 6.06 free space uh, line width. And you can already see this cooperative. This array has a narrower line width, a subradiant line width compared to the uh, free space atom. Okay. But we see both in uh, transmission and reflection. <coughs> And the effectiveness is, is about 80%. So we can switch, you know, transmittance change transmittance by 80% of that mean. I'll come, why is it 80%? Why is it not 99%? What, what's the difference? Just to show you that the ordering is really super crucial for that, we intentionally disorder the array in the z direction. So we allow the particles to move a little bit in the z direction to become slightly disordered. And if you do that and measure the same spectrum, you see, actually, you lose the subradiant properties completely, and the reflected signal basically completely vanishes. Uh, that's what we also expect from the theory. We only have transmission in the forward direction in that case, and no reflection. Anymore. All right, so I plot this. You might ask, well, how good do I have to make my array? How many holes will it tolerate uh, to be this effect? This is what we show here. So it's the measured line width of the transition of the collective decay rate as a function of filling fraction. One would mean I have an atom on every side, 50% the filling fraction down here. And you see this basically just goes linearly down until it reaches the saturation point. It's pretty close to that. We can also measure, measure the cooperative lamp shift. So we also see the change in resonance frequency as a function of filling fraction. So we also see that the system has a different lamp shift than the one of a free space atom, single atom in the system. And if we can you know, measure this now and characterize the whole response uh, per atom as a cooperative direct activity, uh, this goes close to um, 0.8 up to 0.8 power filling fraction of one. And again, I'll come to why it's not one. Just another nice experiment to show you that this ordering is really crucial in the system. Uh, we did an experiment where we took the array we start out with the array, and then we let the particles tunnel in the vertical direction of the array. What happens then is that they basically do block oscillations, so they spread out, but after one block cycle, they come together again at the original position. So they disorder, order again, disorder, order again periodically. And if I look at the reflectance signal, which is in blue here, you see how this decays when they disorder, when they come together again, order goes up again, goes down, goes up again. And the same thing for the subradiant behavior, the red beta. Okay, so everything worked out. All right, here's some just pictures that show a little bit what the, what the light field is doing, what the radiated field looks like from this atomic array. So if you look at the scatter field from this array, it has a forward and backward propagating component. The forward propagating component turns out to be exactly pi out of phase with your incident light field. So if you look at the total field, that destructively interferes here. So there's no light transmitted. And 100% reflection in the ideal case of the perfectly ordered array. Okay. Now, why is it not perfectly ordered? And you already hinted at that. It's basically the little bit of disorder that you have. It's perfectly one reflectance if you would have point particles perfectly positioned on the grid with no position fluctuation. But we have quantum particles, right? They're on our lattice. They have, even in the ground state, they have a Gaussian wave packet, so they have fluctuations. So there are fluctuations given by that. And if we put that into our calculation, we can see that actually pretty nicely matches for what we find in the experiment uh, of this 80% um, reflectance that we, that we measure in the system. All right, so I think who wants to improve on the array, the message is, I mean, everything works as, as promised. The challenge is to get these emitters as localized as possible compared to the wavelength of light. So this can be done either by going to more and narrow spaced arrays. Uh, for us, this was kind of almost borderline when this worked, but it still works as you can see. But if you would go to more narrow spaced arrays, you, can, you, can even, you should be definitely able to improve on that. Okay, <clears throat> final thing I want to show you that people are quite excited about is not only because they are good you know, optical surfaces, if you want to use them, for example, for quantum memories, and you do that with ensembles, you basically, the infidelity scales like one of the optical density of the ensemble. Actually, in this array is it scaled exponentially in the optical depth. So you exponentially win in the infidelity of using the system as quantum memories. And that was something that their chance group actually worked out. Um, yeah, so final thing I want to show you, well, also people got excited about it, that you should be able to switch this mirror by a single impurity atom. 
we should be able to switch these by basically now making use of Rydberg physics, and I'll come to that in a second, uh, and being able to switch these arrays by putting a single ancilla atoms here, where the single atom state of the single atom will control whether this mirror reflects or transmits is on and off. And that's of course great because now we have a huge nonlinearity where a single your single uh, uh, atom can switch hundreds of atoms in their optical behavior. All right, there's actually uh, this built on earlier work actually by Vladan, but Vladan's group who did uh, in MIT where who did similar experiments actually in ensembles on newly structured arrays. Uh, but I told you these arrays are quite different. So let's, let's have a look at that, how that works. So this is the most recent experiment we did on that. So we do it in the following case. So again, we have this setup where we have the array here. We have probe light coming in. We can measure the transmittance of the probe light, or we can send the probe light like this. And we can measure the reflections of the probe light to measure both transmittance and reflectance. And uh, so this is the transition we're probing, this GD transition in our medium atoms. This was the 780 nanometer transition. And now we have to add a little bit of color laser beams. On the one hand, we want to have a single atom that we can switch that will determine whether the mirror reflects or not. And that's actually going to be a transition here where we drive from a ground state to a river state, let's say n 40 ish. Manifold to a UV photon. And there's also another beam we will need here on this on our mirror, which uh, basically sets up a EIT electromagnetic field transparency condition for this um, for the system. So what does this do? We turn on this basically very strong coupling light field here. It actually leads to an outer count splitting of this P state here and basically can realize the situation that now the co-beam in the presence of this very strong coupling beam. Uh, is becoming completely transmitted, transmitted by our system. Uh, so this is uh, what we're going to do here. And uh, so I show you how this works. So this is a subradiant mirror, actually quite large now, a mirror with 2,500 particles. Uh, we look at the transmittance and we see, okay, um, the reflectance here, and we see it reflects, we see a nice signal uh, of the atom. Then if we turn on the EIT condition, if we turn on this coupling laser, we make the mirror completely transparent. We don't change anything else, we just change on it. And then you see actually when we turn on now the Rydberg ancilla, you suddenly see, ah, we switched on the mirror in a very selective area. And this selective area is just the blockade radius of the system. Okay, so the characteristic radius given by the Rydberg interaction in the system, where we can now see a single Rydberg atom in absorption imaging through this effect. You might ask this a little bit of a hollow out here also, and we can talk about that also. We, I think we understand where that comes from. But the main message is we can really switch the mirror in the region of the blockade radius by turning on this uh, distance of that. So here's the spectroscopic signatures of that. So uh, we look first, we have to check whether we get the IT condition. The red line is our standard system, the mirror that I showed you before with this 80% um, reduction in transmittance. Once we turn on the coupling laser, you see that we can make the system transparent. So we get a nice EIT window here. And uh, look at the same thing reflectance. And once we turn on the ancilla atom, you see that the signal completely breaks down. Now, ideally, we would have nicely, if everything would have been perfect, we would have liked to recover the red curve, but we basically turn the um, EIT condition off, and now we're basically back to the um, standard mirror configuration. So we should see the nice red curve again. You see, it's, it is a dramatic change, but it's not quite that. And the reason for that is very simple it's just basically technical limitations how efficient we can create a Rydberg atom and also the decay rate of the Rydberg atom. So remember, a Rydberg atom has to be there to do something. If it decays, for example, or if we didn't create it by our mistake, they cannot do anything, right? And that's all by that. So if we if we include those effects which we measure independently, we get this dash curve. So we are basically seeing exactly this red curve right, that you see here. All right, here's some other data that shows this. So this is the, the probability of finding this ancilla atom in the ground state. So if it's here, we would have a high probability of having a single Rydberg atom, and then we see we have a high reflectance again, the mirror reflects. And when there's no Rydberg atom, the Basically, you're back to the EIT standard EIT condition. So you see how this nicely oscillates with a single atom you're putting into the system, single ripple atom you're putting into the system, all the reflections and genetic If you're interested in the, in, the, in the photon statistics, we can also look at that. If we just ask, you know, if we send in a profiles uh, with a number of photons, how much of them are reflected or transmitted, under ideal situations, we would just expect bimodal 
the distribution. If there's no ancilla, we should see, see nothing. If the ancilla is switched, we should see the signal that is here, this, this dashed Gaussian curve, which is in here, or the profiles intensities that we're using in the experiment. What we see is this solid dark curve, and again, the solid dark curve simply comes from the fact that the Rydberg atom can decay during this pulse time, or it can actually you know, not have been prepared and we put that in, we see we can perfectly reproduce that. So I would say this effect is working as advertised, it's just limitation, uh, simple limitations of our efficiency of our experimental capabilities to create these rubric atoms in a better way. All right, so let me finish then the, this the second part. So I showed you these um, nice new light matter interfaces, uh, these arrays of particles. I showed you also how with the Rydberg atoms, you can switch these mirrors. Uh, with a single ancilla atom, we can switch hundreds of atoms. And I think we're just trying to quantify this. I think it's probably the highest nonlinear response in any medium uh, on the scene. Um, the limitations for us right now are mainly Rydberg preparation fidelity and Rydberg K. As I said, if there's no Rydberg atom, there cannot be any of the switching event. And for the mirror itself, it's just the position, residual position preparations that we have in the system. So otherwise, I think we also understand the system very well. I think much of this can be remedied by you know, going to better photons and photon detectors. Also for us using a magic state transition for the two-level system, something I didn't talk so much about. We're going to shorter sub-wavelength arrays where this collective property of effect should be higher or going to higher Rydberg states where you have like longer lifetime and you can basically exploit more of the effect for the Rydberg atom being there. And yeah, ultimately I think, you know, what I really want to do is I started out with the talk, prepare this non-radiative states these are all radiative states, and that's cool. But if you go prepare the non radiative states, then you really you know, remember you're putting excitation in the system in free space, you have no cavities, nothing, and it will live forever. Or 10 to minus 6. That would be, of course, my task. Yeah, all right. And uh, so let me just acknowledge the people who, uh, who did the work in the lab. So this uh, work on the uh, mirror was basically mostly uh, David's work. And uh, a new PhD student, Cake, uh, actually joined us recently. He did the Rupert switching, and of course, the whole team contributed, but uh, David is one of the key players here. All right, that's what I wanted to tell you. Thanks a lot. Impurities, uh, not just not Rydberg impurities, but just impurities in your uh, uh, array reduce the backscatter, right? So, could I think of a situation where I send in uh, a weak coherent state, and when a photon is passing through or reflecting, it briefly acts as an impurity because one of the atoms can no longer absorb a second photon? Right. So, so can I look at the G2 and reflection and see? Yeah, so what you're asking, actually, I think that's, I can talk about that, but that's actually, I think you're asking what happens if I put more than one photon into the array. Everything I've been telling you is actually nothing quantum. Apart from the mirror, the switching, that was quantum, but uh, mm -hmm. everything else was just, you know, nothing really quantum to it, just single, single particle physics. But if we, um, so if you have the spin model, if you put more than one excitation into the system, so if you're going to expose the, the mirror to higher fluxes with more than one photon in the system, then you have an interacting spin model here that you have to solve. So to solve the radiative, to determine the radiative properties of the array, you will have to solve the many body physics problem of this interacting array. Yeah? And that's, I think, not, has not been explored so much. So, uh, but that's very exciting, actually. What happens? How will it also change maybe the behavior of this non radiative state? Because it could happen that two of the photons collide uh, or the excitations collide uh, and basically decay into radiative state. Uh, or there could be some non linear properties coming from this interaction of the photons in the array. Uh, so people have started to look at that, but eventually it comes down to solving a very complicated mind body problem, which is this uh, long range, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I was just wondering if you engineered some or you would say like periodic 
Well, there would still be a surface, right? So okay. I think there would still be a surface where you could. Well, actually, okay. Well, I think it has to be, if you're thinking about the 3D array, so I think everything here has to be in two plane, has to be a two dimensional or one dimensional array. Do you think about a uh, torus or something? Or sure. But, and I guess, I mean, even. Even say, say you have like some finite n and just like your, you have also a j zero n something, or, or like wh where is the leakage? Uh, well, I guess in okay in that case, first of all, I think for such a situation we have to have a three D uh, configuration. I don't know if the whole thing will work anymore in that case. Um, so for the for the two D case, you will always have either the boundary itself, or you have impurities, as John was saying, you can have holes, and then you will have emissions at those effect centers. And they will lead to a increased radiative lifetime again. So they will uh, make this one radiator stay radiated again. And I think also something we're studying right now is how actually do this, how will these non radiative states affect affected by effect centers? Um, Yes, I, I'm not sure. So, for the situation you mentioned, I don't know. I just don't think a treatment in general would work. Um, so, to populate the non radiative, non -radiative states, yeah. I guess you can presumably pump into them, but is there also a way to kind of coherently attach them? Yeah, I think so. That's yes. a good question. Yeah. I think there are two ways to do that. One is you can do something very fast. Relations of your two level system on time scales faster than the two level K rate. Uh, so, for example, you could have you know, multiple Rama, you could have Rama which put multiple H by K into the system. Um, but then you have to actually very quickly switch the states in the system also. So, this is something actually that this um, group in China actually managed to do, but not in all of the arrays. So, that's what they did in ensemble. The other way I think you can do, you can just do the most, what we want to do is you just use multi photon transition. So you just use, uh, and we found a three photon transition in rubidium where the sum of the wave vectors will lead you to a K point outside the mode. So we have this kinetic and it's like this then. So we have a, so you have your two level system here, but you have other states here. And now you can drive a, let's say, three photon transition here. And you have this wave vector k1, k2, k3, and they will add up to a delta k, depending on how your angles, how you send them between. And if you tune those angles and uh, to a point where now they should lie, remember this is the picture we're looking at, what we want to set up, we want to end up somewhere here, not here. We want to end in non radiative state. So now you have to tune your angles to a point where, where they will end here. And then what you should see for that, that actually. If you just scan, I think that simply what you would just see if you scan the line with that transition to measure that, you would see a super narrow line, which is determined by the collective decay rate, residual decay rate of that non radiative state, which I really would be a million times smaller. And then I think we're going to be limited by our laser noise. We're going to need great lasers <laughs> to show that even. But even I think even showing an order of magnitude of factor of 100 degrees would be really spiking as well. I have another question to the surprise, I guess, of absolutely no one. Um, so we started out talking about cooperativities, yes. right? And so if I write it as G squared over gamma, gamma or something, you've reduced gamma, right? You've reduced the emission rate. But my naive thought would be you've also reduced G. No. But to the optical mode, sure you have. The dipole moment is smaller. Yeah, but you're coupling to the collective mode and you're coupling to the collective mode is perfect. Well, I guess I'm just saying, imagine I put this ensemble in a cabinet, mm -hmm. right? If, if I try to couple to that same radiating transition, right? It's, so there's some directional emission at the ends from the defects there, but the fact that it emits more slowly means that G has gone down, right? Uh, if you want to put that in the cavity, for example. Yeah. Uh, 
probably, but you don't, that's not the way how you would interface that with anything. You would interface the arrays, the nice things, you don't need a cavity. You interface them by just shining a light beam directly onto the array. I guess I'm just wondering, I want it to absorb a photon yeah. efficiently yeah. of some wavelength. Yeah. So what wavelength does it absorb super efficiently? Well, on that, on that PG transition here, or if you set up some EIT scheme, you can have that also, you know, store, convert the photon excitation to spin excitation by some photon scheme, like. Uh, so you're saying on the on the, on the, on the single absorbs. photon transition, it absorbs strongly? Yeah. Well, you would. What direction do you well, want me to send the light in? But you're not, well, well then you're excited that, the question is what do you want to excite? Do you want to excite the non radiative mode? That doesn't work. The non radiative radiant mode, you cannot couple to directly with this because it's, it doesn't couple to that. That's the whole point, right? So, the way, but, but it still couples strongly, to, as, I, as I said, these arrays couple, couple strongly to incident light here if you want to convert. Let's say now, let's say you send in a beam like this, it will absorb 100% efficiency. A photon will con convert it into some spin excitation here. Now, if you want to store that photon, we could either do what I said before, we could manipulate. The state spiral it up. So this is now a k equals zero excitation we made. So that would radiate. But now if I can do a very fast manipulation to add that to the spin wave, you could add that k to bring it from here to here very quickly, then it's stored. But of course I can also store it by with Raman to put it into another hyperfine ground state. Well, that would I think be something like this, right? No, I'm just saying in general, right? Like once I put it into the excited state, I can just use a laser beam to put it into the either hyperfine ground state. And then it's also super long. Range. Yes. Right. So I guess I'm, I'm just trying to figure out yeah, but from yeah, a quantum yeah, optics perspective. Yeah, you're thinking about the ensemble, but the ensemble, everything scales like OBD, right? So how does, but maybe this is the question. Addition. How does your how does your absorption cross section or cooperativity scale with your atom number? Well, that's what I want to say. That, well, let's put like this the infidelity of a quantum memory of an ensemble is this famous number 5.8 divided by OBD. Mm -hmm. Right. So we. So you only or for a cavity, you actually one of us. Mm -hmm. I think maybe you have clever schemes for this, but I don't remember. Yeah. Is it too far? So, it's even worse than okay, but yeah. Let's look at the Just point about scaling. So it's actually yeah. very weak scaling, it's not so great. So what, what you see is for the arrays, this goes like this exponentially better. It's to the minus O D. Okay, so maybe the question is why? Because you told me that the line width goes like a power of the number of atoms, right? And the, so unless the matrix element is exponential in the number of atoms, I'm confused about how I would get an exponential scaling out of that. Well, I think we'll, let's just look up Derek's paper on this before you, before you calculate this. Mm -hmm. yeah, but that, that's, that's, that, that's the main thing. I, I mean, but that's, that's the super efficient thing. Exponential. Exponentially better than a cavity. Better than. But I mean, in practice, of course, I have to tell you there are limitations, and these limitations come from the fact that these things are not perfectly sitting in the right positions. These position fluctuations are critical. But if you can solve that, I mean, you know, we can do it in superconducting arrays. You don't have to do it with this works for any system. We're just doing it with our atoms and, and optical regime. You have a better system, you can maybe find better parameter regime where this is much better. Or for atoms, you can find a better atom, you know, where this ratio is, is much better and we have much stronger corporate. So, yeah, that's that's the claim. I, I think we are not there yet to, to prove something like that because of the issues I said, but I think it's not a fundamental problem. Yeah. It's just about finding the right system that we do that. Definitely, I'm not disagreeing, but I am confused. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just curious since we can uh, already see the effects of wealth oscillations on the reflectivity of the array. Um, I guess, are the atoms occupying non radiative states like halfway through the block? Mm -hmm. No, they actually, they remember if they were, when we do the block oscillations, they're actually done out of like. In the z direction. Uh, okay. So we're okay. just ordering the z direction, we're not changing the k momentum. So the k momentum is still zero, and we're just ordering the array in the z direction. And uh, then you see this the, the, the mirror immediately reacts to that, it just shows you how sensitive this mirror is to position fluctuations. 
And we can also calculate that and increase for tabulate. But this is a nice way of testing it because it also the mirror will come back when they all come back to the same condition. So nice, nice exponent. So go ahead. But but can you also do that in, in plane so that the states do go through the non-radiative ones that they also well, you have to do it very fast. The problem is you have to do it faster than the radiative lifetime. You bring them here. You know, to, to, that's what I say to go from here to here. That you can do that. That's what is basically put in Shanghai demonstrated. Uh -huh. uh, that you can very quickly, but you have to do it very quickly because this state radiates. You have to do it on a nanosecond time scale. Uh, you have to be able to manipulate that. That's not impossible. You can do that. They, they show how to do that. So they just add momenta and uh, basically you have to do very, very fast. On the slow, but again, this is rubidium. If you would choose a different way to do it in strontium or tertium, where these bandwidths are much more convenient, where we're talking about six kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, then, then it's actually you have much more time to do it and it's much more feasible. So that's why I'm saying I think this all, you know, we just had our atoms, we had our one insulators, we'd say, well, now we try this, let's, let's give it a try. And they actually had the other deficiencies in our system that I didn't even talk about, but I think there are really good systems where this, where this really works very well. That's maybe the take home. But apart from that, I think it's just cool quantum optics to see them and to think that you can have this, this effect. And that kind of was overlooked a little bit. Well, let's thank you, Manuel, again.